So here we are at Hiroshi Region Tapas with our good friend Mark Parloff. Mark Parloff is, uh, is, uh, doesn't like to talk about his, his normal life. What do, you, do you talk about it? No. Right, exactly. So we'll skip that and we'll get into wines. I first met, met Mark Parloff when he, um, he founded a project. It was his vision called Evening Land Vineyards. And it was based out of Oregon, the Sonoma Coast, Santa Barbara, and of course Burgundy. I, I, I would say the pursuit of it really was to find out how we can make world-class Pinot Noir in America. We already know it can be done in Burgundy, but in America, is that safe to say? Yeah, I think we had Burgundy as our uh, baseline, so we could measure ourselves against that. And we never did anything very grand in Burgundy because we had smaller aspirations just to come up to a village level someday to a Premier crew, but really the whole idea of doing Burgundy with the other three appellations was to, to give ourselves a baseline to measure ourselves as we went along. So um, you had a long-term lease with Seven Springs Vineyard. Yes. You bought a vineyard uh, in Occidental that used to go to Kistler Reserve bottling. You planted an unbelievable vineyard down in Santa Barbara. What did you learn from all of that? Uh, <clears throat> maybe Three pies is too many pies. <laughs> um, uh, it looks good. It's just like when you walk into an ice cream store and you want to, you know, have all the flavors. Uh, and maybe you can't do your best work when you're uh, distracted and you're trying to administer three winery teams, three vineyard crews, uh, three sets of investors, um, and uh, it just became overwhelming. So it was no longer only about the focus of making world-class Pinot Noir Chardonnay. It became very comprehensive in scope. It did, it did, and it became um, a huge marketing undertaking, and, and you know, which was very gratifying. Uh, but you know, some of the wines rose higher than others, and then petty jealousies developed between right. the children. And right. you know, uh, anybody who has more than one child knows that Understand it never that. goes smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I think there was a lot of off-topic stuff going on that I was, some of which I was aware of, some of which I probably caused, but none of which really led us to do better with right. um, So let me ask you this, so uh, rather than dwelling on that, you, you, you've spun off now, you departed there, and you, uh, I started looking for you because I knew, because of your fire for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and specifically on the Burgundian model, I knew you would surface. So I tried contacting you on Facebook. I tried contacting friends. Do you, you know where Mark Tarloff is? And we finally connected. And then you were telling me about a new project called Chapter 24. Yes. So Chapter 24 is the last chapter of the Odyssey. And what's interesting about it uh, is that it was actually not the last chapter that Homer wrote. That was chapter 23. And Homer wrote this, uh, this seminal work of Western narrative literature and died, thinking that there was going to be 23 chapters. And about 100 years later, the Greeks added the 24th chapter because they didn't love the ending. Um, so I thought, well, Makes we can sense. add a new ending uh, to Homer. We can add a new ending to anything. So we call it chapter 24. And uh, Dominique Lafont, who I had worked with at Evening Land, uh, who was very supportive uh, both while I was there and after I left, he and I would have long discussions about Chardonnay and why we can't get some of the aspects of Chardonnay which are so amazing, which is the minimally uh, invasive techniques you use to extract these amazing flavors out of Chardonnay and texture. Why we can't do a Pinot, and he said, "Well, if you're going to do a Pinot-only project, I suggest you go to either Chambol or Beaumont and get one of the fancy guys. That actually, only works with thin-skinned, um, sort of elegant Pinot. So that's how it started. And I have to thank Dominique really uh, for encouraging me to uh, take what I knew about Chardonnay, because the first year we made Chardonnay, the 2007." You know, I said to him, I can't believe you make Moroche the same way as you make this, because we didn't do anything. And he said, well, you come in 2008 and you make Moroche with me, and we see And lo and behold, we did nothing. He doesn't even do Bastinage. You know? Really? 
Yeah, he just presses it, he settles it for a day, which is different than Koch, I guess, but he puts it in a barrel, and that's the end of it. Uh, that's it. That's it. Wow. Yeah. So. Okay, so um, from there it becomes, uh, you, 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 uh, you, of course, uh, hire a consultant. Yes, uh, so I, I, I had a list from Louis Mich uh, from uh, Dominique, and on it were a couple of winemakers, including Louis Michel Liget Belair, whose family uh, uh, owns uh, La Romanée, which is probably the signature. Uh, well, there's some debate on his little lane. You know, they live on like Von Romanée Lane or something, <laughs> and across the street is his neighbor Aubert de Valain, who owns a, a Domaine Romanée Conti. Um, but as Louis Michel points out, the name of the town is Vaughn, and the name of its most fi famous vineyard is Romanée, La Romanée, not, it's not called Vaughn Romanée County. Uh, <clears throat> so he owns that, and his family until 1933 owned La Tache. And what was interesting about Louis Michel is uh, he started the, the family's domain in 2001, and he came back after 50 years of their vineyards being leased to their cousins, the Bouchards. And he hired uh, uh, Henri Jaillet to right. be his consultant. So I'm going, well, this is pretty <laughs> cool. Good. It's pretty cool if he learned to make wine from Henri Jaillet. And when I said to him, why did Jaillet sign on with you? Because I'm sure everybody had been trying to get him. This was at the end of his, I mean, he was famous, famous, famous right. by 01. He said, well, Jaillet famously once said that the only thing he could think to criticize about the vineyard Latash was the fact that it was made by DRC. <laughs> so he says, I think it was a little bit of revenge on, on Jaillet's uh, And in 03, when they confronted a very, very warm year, Jaillet sat down with him and said, we have to come up with a technique so that we don't have to pick these grapes early, even though the sugars are crazy high, so that we get ripe tannins and ripe seeds, but we don't make a 15% alcohol wine. So they came up with something called an infusion process in an abnormally hot year for them, 03. Uh, and uh, when Louis Michel told me about it, I said, well, that sounds like most years that we have in, in Oregon. And he said, yes, I'm interested in this for two reasons. One, Dominique says you're a good guy and that you make you know, excellent wine and know how to sell it and that you'll be able to pay me if you say you're going to pay me. And secondly, I think uh, uh, you're absolutely right. What we had in 2003 is probably what you experienced or right. closer to what you experience all the time, which is no rain in the summer. Not so much the temperature issue, it's the lack of rain. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that we might be five years ahead of us on the global warming. So what I do today and Oregon, I could be doing it five years in Burgundy, and I'd rather know how to deal with it than have to guess. Right, so in other words, prepare for it, essentially. Prepare for it. Learn all the ins and outs before you actually have to uh, have to, to deal with it. Yeah, and, 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 and Dominique said to me one day, which shocked me, he said, you know, I take more from Oregon back to Merceau than I bring from Merceau to Oregon. He said, because you are confronting things that I know we're going to see. Uh, like these weird weather patterns. Um, so this infusion technique, his interest in knowing everything there was to know about Oregon, not only because I was hiring him, but because it had relevance to his own work at back in the domain, meant to me that we were gonna have a really tight, integrated, uh, and overlapping set of goals. Right. Okay, so here we are. Here we have uh, Louis Michel. And you, 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 let's, let's talk a little bit about, first of all, this winemaking technique. Yes. So we're talking about long, cool fermentations? Talking about long, cool fermentation. Uh, we're talking about no punching down, uh, not breaking the skins. Whole berry is very important. A um, lot of pumping over, which does two things. Um, it puts oxygen in the must um, so that the yeast exists on both the oxygen uh, that's actually in the liquid as well as the anaerobic, uh, getting energy from the anaerobic right. metabolism of carbohydrates into uh, uh, alcohol and uh, CO2. 
so it makes the yeast a little lazier because they have all this cool oxygen. Uh, and so they convert the sugar actually at a lower rate. So we can actually pick at higher sugars and come out with lower alcohol. So you can pick at higher sugars and higher, uh, more physiological maturity. And then by doing it this way, the yeast metabolizes sugar in a different, in a slower rate than, than uh, other techniques. Correct. And so you can start off with 26 bricks of sugar, and then you can still end up with a wine 13 degree alcohol. Right. So 24 bricks, for instance, for us, we're 19 grams of sugar for every one degree of alcohol. So 24 bricks is a 12.6 percent alcohol wine, right. which <coughs> is remarkable. But right. it means you have fully ripe grapes. <coughs> This long, slow, cool fermentation, so the fermentation is 24 degrees centigrade, or 75 Fahrenheit. Um, it's a happy environment for these yeasts. There's oxygen, it's not hot, the alcohol is not yet so high that it kills them, so they have a longer, happier life. And you get a different texture to the wine. I mean, you've had the wine. They have a completely different texture than any other Oregon wine. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think the other another point that you brought up to me was, you know, one of the keys to this project now is also, it also encourages deliciousness in the wine uh, right out of the gates. So. Well, it's another thing that uh, Jaye, you know, when, when Louis Michel, you know, we all get nervous when we meet these fancy guys, right? Like I, when I was meeting Louis Michel, even though I've been down the road with Dominique, it was a new guy, he has a really big castle, he has red pants. <laughs> he, has, he has a dog about my height. Uh, he's, he's pretty intimidating. And you say a lot of kind of stupid things in a big hurry to try and get him to do what you want him to do. And when he was talking to uh, Jaye about row direction, because La Romane is north-south rows and right. Romane Conti is east-west. Right. And Jaye put up his hand and said, I don't care. He said, the only obligation of a great wine is the minute somebody gives you money, it must be delicious. Until they give you money, it doesn't matter. But the minute you accept one penny from them, it has to be delicious. It can evolve and get better, but delicious is why they're buying it. It's, you know, it's a luxury good, nobody has to have it. And they're buying it for flavor and texture and how it makes them feel. And to hear Henri Jaillet, arguably the most famous right. maker Anymore, you know, and some of the most expensive, and Louis Michel Lige Belair with some of the most expensive, talk about satisfying consumers on the delicious scale rather than all this arcane, <laughs> right, right. this arcane winery stuff, and you know, it's fantastic. You know, they don't want to know. He said, if they ask you about yeast, you can talk about it. If they ask you about fermentation temperatures, punch downs, pump overs, or oak treatment. Fine. That may be why it's delicious, but basically you have to guarantee them that the wine is going to be delicious the minute they open it. So the next step that you did is you to complete your team or to add to your team, you hire Mike Etzel Jr. Yes. So Mikey, uh, to distinguish him from his father, Mike, who is um, Beau Frères, is Beau Frères. So his uncle is Robert Parker. Right. So we have Uncle Bob, <laughs> uh, who uh, you know, who is not normally considered to be a friend of Pinot Noir. Right. Uh, and we have Mike Etzel, um, and it's not, it, so Mike's father makes one of the most famous Oregon, uh, Pinot. Oregon Pinots. Uh, so Mikey is 28 years old, uh, obviously grew up there, uh, basically grew up in the vineyards, knows everybody, and knows all the nooks and crannies. Right. You know, it doesn't take a genius to say, Oh, Domain Serene has a lovely winery and is on Dundee Hill, and you know those aren't the grapes we're after. We're after the grapes that people uh, 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 don't know about. Like so, Highland, I had never heard of Highland. So Highland's an interesting vineyard, planted in '71, one of the right. oldest vineyards out there. The quarry clone, largely right. cool climate near the Van Duzer right. corridor, uh, volcanic soils. Uh, but I had never heard of it. I mean, so you were finding all these really cool. Uh, uh, Lots of land. Yeah. Forty-year-old vines. Forty-year-old vines. Uh, we found a couple of really interesting own rooted vines. No phylloxera because they're not near anything else. Up in the coast range. Uh, 
And the wonderful thing about Louis Michel is he has no preconceived notion about what's a good vineyard. So it could be in Dundee, or it could be by Bergstrom, or, or, right. or, or you know, anywhere else. He really tastes the wine and says, this I like and this I don't. And this fermentation technique actually requires different skin. You know, really wow. heavy, thick skins are not going to fly. Uh, and the yeast population, because it's all wild yeast, wild, yeah. has to want to eat slowly. So some of the bigger, more famous vineyards, the yeast were not all that happy. So we got we got some sour taste. We got so we declassified all of those. So essentially, what you do, I remember you saying, Louis Michel, uh, in the beginning, you guys were going to buy all these different vineyards and from different places and aspects and soils and all that stuff. Right. And and and, and I think right now you buy from like 44 different parcels and vineyards. Uh, 48 this year. 48. Yeah. And then. To that, you add every year when you find interesting things. At the same time, you also uh, weed Subtract. some out. Right. Yeah. So we're. Uh, I think we changed over 18 this year, from last year, and from 12 to 13, we changed over 14. And it's all in search of better and better plant material that works for your style. the way the style and the way that you do things. Right. You know, terroir, as you know, Chuck is 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 is, is earth and air, right. and water, and people. Um, and, you know, it's like people start to look like they're dogs. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's the natural selection process. It's not that the dogs start to grow with like people, it's people buy dogs and look like them. Right. Um, because it's comfortable. Um, and, you know, there's a real personality to winemaking. Um, and when the personality of the winemaker <coughs> Uh, interlocks with the personality of the ground and the climate, that's when you get a great one. And, you know, it's when we find the spot, the piece of soil with the temperature and the climate and the aspect that works with our personality, then I think, you know, we'll start buying. So we started a lease, we leased three vineyards this year, which we now control the farming on, which is the first time we've done that. Um, all in the coast range, all high altitude, all in transitional soils, uh, going from uh, volcanic to sedimentary. So where they meet in the middle, the soils are actually quite shallow because you have all this river rock with all this decomposed uh, volcanic soil. Um, so you know we're hoping that those are going to be the places where we'll get our best. Work. Yeah, you know, right now um, uh, for the viewers, uh, they have a, a entry level Pinot called Two Messengers. And then uh, chapter 24 start. Actually, Two Messengers is now a L'Envoyer line, is that correct? Yes, so Two Messengers is part of a program called the Maison L'Envoyer, which means the House of the Messenger, uh, which is... Separate from chapter 24. It is, and it's, a, it's going to be a survey of uh, American, Australian, New Zealand, and French Pinot at an entry level, so that people can see what Pinot does in various climates each made by different, as opposed to Evening Land, where we made it all. Right. Here, they're going to local winemakers and saying, you make the entry level wine for us. The great news for that, it means I have some place to declassify all my right. wine that right. doesn't go into the chapter. Right. So you have uh, Maison Lamboy, which you do with your importer. Yes. Okay, so that's a separate project. And then with chapter 24, then you really start off with fire and flood. Fire and flood. Um, so. There are two things you need to know about Oregon uh, vineyards. Are they volcanic or fire-based soils where all the nutrients have been burned out of them by the volcano? Uh, or are they flood-based soils? So that's an inorganic soil. It's an volcanic. inorganic right. soil. Uh, so that's one stress level. And as you know, the whole thing about growing great wine as grapes as opposed to great table grapes is stress. Right. Um, you know, table grapes are very happy and they're big and they're sweet and they're juicy and you want to just eat them up. Uh, and then the uh, <coughs> flood soils came from the Missoula floods, which are much newer soils. The volcanics are very old. Uh, it was about 20,000 years ago. It's quite, I mean, there were people there when we had the Missoula floods. Uh, and the, um, uh, the ice dam broke on the Columbia River near Missoula, right. Montana. And flooded the valley. And up to about 350 feet in most places, um, you have this 
wash of river soil that, that came out over the volcano. So fire and flood are uh, basically the chapter 24 entry level. Then we make a wine called the last chapter. Can I just go back for a second though on, on fire and flood? Because uh, the volcanic is an uh, inorganic soil, does it, that also delay the sugar ripeness more, longer and therefore yes, they, more physiological maturity? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also get um, uh, you get more of a vertical uh, feeling in the wine. The mm -hmm. flavors tend to be a little more red fruit. Right. The flood soil. I mean, it's handy. Elevated. Right. right. It's it's elevated, uh, and it's very handy because fire is red, right. and flood and right. water is blue. So you get red fruit. You know, we try to keep it simple. Red, red fruit and blue fruit. So we have fire and we have flood. We do. And then the next level up is called the last chapter. It is the last chapter, uh, which is uh, a small, uh, it's 400 cases. Uh, and it is really where we're getting closest to the textural components that we're looking for in the wine. I think, as you and I have discussed, we're still searching for that minerality that you can get in Burgundy uh, and in some diatomaceous earth. But we're getting a stoniness, and we're getting a really um, seamless texture. Um, so you get a big American flavor. I mean, these are American wines. They're, they're, we're not trying to masquerade as, as, as Burgundy. You get big American flavor, and then the wine sort of disappears. Uh, the actual physical mass of the wine goes away, and you're left with basically the finish. So. You know, the flavor comes on the finish rather than the attack. As mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if this was a physics, an experiment in physics, nuclear physics, it really would be about trying to find mass with no volume. Mm -hmm. Is that you're trying, yeah. to, trying to find a richness without weight. Right. right. So the chapter 24 is a blend of both sedimentary and volcanic rock? Yes, it's uh, two and mean? two. It's two vineyards. Uh, Four uh, vineyards total. Four so Highlands is one of the vineyards? Yes. Highland. Shea Vineyard is one of the vineyards, the top of the hill? Top of the hill, last row, of Shea, uh, which is 777 mm -hmm. uh, through 3309 Rootstock, way up on the west facing hill, uh, probably the coolest part of Shea. Uh, and then there's another vineyard that's owned by uh, uh, Laurent Montague, uh, which is on the same saddle as Shea, just two sides of the same hill was the other sedimentary. Uh, and then we have a very high altitude uh, uh, vineyard there, which is in Shehalem Mountains, but way at the top, where Shehalem goes from sedimentary to volcanic, volcanic right. uh, which is called Tresori. Uh, and that's about, I would say, of the volcanic piece, it's maybe 20% and 80% of the volcanic piece, is the Highland Vineyard, which are some of the oldest vines right. in in Oregon, it's a quarry farm, and very shallow soil. And then last but not least on, on, your, on your list, you have a wine called Double Zero. Yes, Double Zero is, um, yes, a, a, it, it's a personal insanity of mine. Um, <laughs> How many bottles did you produce? 300 bottles. Exactly. Uh, and uh, the wine is made by um, a bunch of very nice women uh, who come to the um, vineyard, and once the grapes are harvested right in the vineyard, we snip the grapes oh, off the stem. On the, the, what do you call it? Pyramid? Pedestal. 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 Um, so it looks like a jack, like when you were a right. kid. Um, so the, the grapes are completely sealed. So there is a little bit of carbonic or intracellular fermentation going on. Um, you don't do that for the rest of the peanuts? We don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means it's the ripest part of the stem because right. it's the laciest. It's like a fourth of an inch. Yeah, and it's the place where the grape is sucking right. everything right. out of it, right? And it keeps it sealed, it gives it a little spiciness, um, the potassium in the so stem. That's your version of stem included? That is our version. <laughs> it's 100% whole cluster. Uh, it's um, uh, La Lou uh, Loire uh, does it for some of her Richebourg, and it's like crazy. I mean, it's insane. I mean, you can't really make any money on it. It takes eight hours to do a barrel. Of 15 people um, doing the little snip snip thing. But it makes a very, very uh, unique, it's very unique, it has a great story, and it's very lacy. Um, the, the texture of it, again, is very different. I mean, very textural, uh, very different than the, 
last chapter. Quite exciting, all of this. And it seems like it's continually evolving as you, as all of you get more comfortable into working with vineyards and, and, and adding on new vineyards and working as a team. Yeah, I think we're a pretty restless bunch. I think Louis Michel, uh, we just hired a guy named Max Marriott who worked with Louis Michel in, uh, um, in Burgundy and then ran a wine program in Central Otago. And uh, so Max joined us this year. As what? Uh, he's, he's, he's a winemaker and, and, and Mikey is only gonna make double zero. Um, so we have two, basically both programs going side by side. Because the double zero, which we're now going to make eight barrels instead of one, is really a full-time job. And is Mikey doing his own label too? On top of Mikey it? does a, a label called uh, Horse Tail mm -hmm. and Coat Tails. Um, mm -hmm. Coat Tails referring to that as the writing on the coat tails of Uncle Bob and his father, uh, which he does with his brother. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're just about to hire actually a viticulturalist full-time because Louis Michel wants somebody, even where we buy grapes, that we're gonna um, have somebody full-time looking at that, those soils, those plants, uh, actually working wow. in the vineyard. Uh, so unlike most times where we buy grapes and they handle all of the uh, farming culture and farming, we're gonna actually have our own team that's wow. going to do that. And wow. So, and, and you know, <coughs> I think Louis Michel, excuse me, has a chip on his shoulder about DRC. Right. I have a chip on my shoulder about evening life. <laughs> so I think both of us are seeking some sort of personal statement in saying, not only do we do things our way and are constantly pushing things to be better, but we're not going to rest ever because we can't because we have both seen what happens <clears throat> right, when, you rest on your laurels. when you rest on your laurels. And uh, uh, I think you know, both of us were, it, it wasn't him, it was his family in 1933 that put Latasha up for auction. But in my case, it was me. So I, I think it's a bit of fuel. Um, you know, revenge, Driving force. I think revenge is as good as <laughs> anything else. I think we'll leave it at that, because I think it's a perfect way to end uh, this talk with our really good friend Mark Tarloff from Chapter 24. Mark, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Whoa.